Hello folks, welcome to the Hump Day Hall number 38 for June 3rd, 2015. We got a nice, healthy, big, huge stack of comics. It's a huge week this week in comic book land because Convergence has ended and DC is now back to their run of comics, uh, not returning to the new 52, but lots of new titles, about 24 reboots, I mean, not this week, but in total, we got a lot of new comics, maybe I should run down the list, baby, a bunch of new ones came out this week, too, that uh, I wasn't able to get some of them, uh, I was really, really thinking about jumping on Bizarro, number one, which came out this week, but I... I just couldn't do it. There were too many other titles that I was thinking about getting. And then also Batman Beyond I was thinking about getting, but I just couldn't pull the trigger. There were just too many Marvel titles this week for me to consider that. So I had to go with m more Marvel titles this week. But these are the new titles that are coming out in the future weeks. We got Batman Beyond, Black Canary, Constantine the Hellblazer, Doomed, Dr. Fate, Earth 2, Society... Green Lantern and the Lost Army, which I'll definitely be getting. Justice League 3001, Justice League of America, Martian Manhunter, which I think I may be biting on. Midnighter, the Omega Men, which I did get. Red Hood Arsenal, Robin Son of Batman, Starfire, We Are Robin, Cyborg, Mystic U, and Dark Universe. And then there's a bunch of one-shots coming out, some miniseries like Batmite. Bizarro, Harley Quinn and a Power Up Girl team up, Power Girl team up rather, Prez number 1 through 12, and Section 8 number 1 through 6. So big, big week for DC returning back to normal, and the one issue that I did get people back to DC is definitely my favorite comic, Green Lantern, and if you look it says Green Lantern Renegade. That's right, folks. Hal Jordan has gone rogue. As we know, in the end of issue number 40, Hal got into a huge brawl with uh, Kilwag from the Green Lantern Corps. Uh, the public image of the Green Lanterns across the universe has just gone way, way down. I mean, the, the universe has not been happy with the Green Lanterns. Uh, and in a move... Hal Jordan kind of started beef with the Green Lanterns to kind of maybe diffuse that situation a little bit, maybe get some of the heat off the Green Lantern Corps, and it seems to have backfired, and Hal Jordan has had to go on rogue. I mean, the last issue, the fight between Hal Jordan and Kilwag was, like, huge. Uh, I don't even know. I think the way it ended, it, it almost appeared that Kilwag is dead. So I was like, shit. I mean, I'm wondering what's going on. We don't seem to get any answers to that in this issue, but what we do get is a lot of new revelations. Uh, you have to kind of infer that this is taking place sometime after the last issue of 40, um, before the two-month break that DC had because of Convergence, because take a look at Hal Jordan, people. He has, like, long hair. He has a new costume. He's, like, wearing, like, a trench coat. He has, like, a Batman freaking belt. He, he's all new. He, he's all geared up here, peeps. He also has that weapon that he stole from the uh, last issue from the Green Lantern Court, the uh, Krona Gauntlet, Krona's Gauntlet. So you do see a little bit of that in action here. And it seems to be a bit of an unstable weapon. Hal Jordan doesn't seem to have as good of a connection with this weapon as he does with his ring. And we're also introduced to Darlene, which is like an onboard computer AI. Uh, and that should be really interesting. And she's kind of, you know, spunky and uh, says lots of cool stuff, snappy dialogue. So I'm really, really looking forward to this. And it has a huge cliffhanger ending that directly is going to relate to the literal title, uh, Green Lantern Lost Army, Green Lantern Corps Lost Army. Like, where are they? Where are they? Well, in the end of this issue, you get a little sneak preview of what kind of is up. So pretty, pretty cool. Great issue. I'm real excited to be back on the Green Lantern train. All right. The next DC comic I got was number one of one of the new comics, The Omega Men. 
And it's kind of going to be like a morally ambiguous title. I was reading some articles about this. Uh, a lot of people are kind of liking it to a harder core Star Wars because I guess the Omega Men uh, originally was a series like in the 80s. It's going to be a little bit different and spruced up here. Um, but back to the Star Wars comparison, the Omega Men are kind of like rebels. They're kind of like terrorists, if you will. And they're fighting an army known as the Citadel, or a government organization, a government known as the Citadel. Problem is, I guess the way that this comic is going to go is it's going to be real morally ambiguous, where the reader is going to have to decide kind of who's in the right and who's in the wrong. Like, it's not going to be so clear-cut that the rebels, who are the Omega Men, who are going to be doing things hardcore to kind of get what they want. They'll do whatever it takes to get the things that they want. Uh, so I think it's going to be really, really interesting. And the Omega Men killed Kyle Rayner. Uh, there was like an eight-page preview of the Omega Men. I don't know if it was for free, that if that came out during free comic book day, or if that was just in the end of certain issues in DC I'm not really sure because I never saw the preview but Kyle Rayner is dead uh, the White Lantern is dead and these guys the Omega Men did it and the rest of the universe the Citadel if you will they want uh, revenge they want revenge so it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens um, I really love, like, Sinestro, which is the big spinoff of the Green Lantern comics, so I don't know how much of, like, the Green Lantern universe and stuff is still going to be incorporated into this, but apparently this is going to be a 12-issue run. It's going to go for a year, and um, there may be some more things after that. But the writer of this story, who is Tom King, he says that this is really going to have a definitive, be you know, beginning, middle, and end. So, the artwork in here is great, too, by Barnaby Baganda, and the colorist, uh, Ramulo Fajardo Jr., who I'm not familiar with either one of these guys, is awesome, and I want to show you a couple things here that kind of are cool. Here's a popping head. I mean, who doesn't love a popping head, right? Boom, not really sure what happened to that guy, but it's great. There's lots of like alien looking characters in here, but the other thing I want to talk about is look at what's on the bottom of this. It's a freaking Twix commercial with Nick Lachey. Who was he from 99 degrees or something? Look at that. It, 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 it's not like a, com you know, a advertisement that's on one page. They're splitting it on the two pages. I don't think that's something they've done. So it's kind of weird. It's like, what the hell? So you really, you know, I mean, it's not really that bad. I mean, a lot of people on the Internet are kind of making a big deal about it. I'm not sure how long DC is going to keep doing this, but this Twix ad is running, I think, in like every DC comic. Like so far in the Green Lantern comic, they've done it. And I'm pretty sure probably in my Batman Beyond comic, yes, in my Batman Beyond comic, they do the Twix commercial again. Now, I guess when the graphic novels come out, for whatever comics do get the graphic novels, they uh, are going to be taking that out, thankfully. I guess DC kind of had to sit down with the artists and said, hey, look, man, um, be, be aware that we're going to be having these kind of advertisements this month in the comics. So, I don't know. I would love to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Does it make you want to buy Twix? Does it piss you off? To be honest, to me, it's not really that big of a deal, but I wanted to bring it up because lots of people on the internet are bringing it up. All right. Batman Arkham Knight, number five. This is my final DC title of the month. Uh, you have two different kind of stories going on here. The first story, you have Barbara Gordon in wheelchair and all, yep, with the Twix commercial. We might as well put that in there. Barbara Gordon makes a return as Oracle as well. Batgirl, Oracle. Uh, Bruce Wayne is also in the first story. Uh, 
Barbara Gordon and Bruce Wayne are trying to convince Commissioner Gordon to run for mayor. So pretty, pretty cool, pretty interesting story. Can you think of a character more deserving, more caring about Gotham than Commissioner Gordon? Mm, maybe Batman, but pretty cool. Wouldn't that be kind of a cool story if he did run for office? So I'm really looking forward to seeing where they go with this. The next story uh, focuses on Bane, and it just has a lot of ton of action in it. Ton, ton of action. Heavy on the action. Doesn't seem so much on the characterization. And Bane gets Batman in a good face plan sequence. Notice the pain. Notice the pain of Batman and a look of terror. That's right. Batman can look scared, but Batgirl on Batman variant covers. Batgirl variant covers cannot. If you know what I'm referencing, you'll know what I'm talking about then. Okay, on to Marvel. And this was probably my biggest week for Marvel Comics, but I have a complaint. I'm sorry, I have a complaint that I want to talk about. My big complaint here is that Marvel, all this week, in one week, released all three freaking Star Wars titles. In one week, they released Star Wars, number six, Darth Vader, number six, and Princess Leia, number four or five of that miniseries, all in one week. I'm like, oh my god, you are killing me, Marvel, by putting all those out in one week. Why? Why did you do that? Well, I know why. Because assholes like me end up buying it. So, first, Star Wars, my favorite one of the three. Uh, big, big issue here, people. Number six, we have Boba Fett tracking down Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. And uh, they have a showdown, folks. So, it's pretty cool, pretty hot and heavy. Also, there is a huge... Take a look at that standoff. Nice overhead standoff. There is a huge revelation here with Han Solo. I am not going to spoil it to you, but it is huge. It is a bomb, people. And it is going to maybe change, if you read this book, it is going to change the way that you look at Han Solo and Princess Leia's relationship Big time. Because let me tell you something. There's been a lot left out about Han Solo. Okay? I'm just going to say that this is a pretty huge revelation. I'm not going to I'm not gonna spoil it for anybody. If you really want to look, there's stuff on the internet. Um, I mean, there is a lot of action here between uh, Han Solo and Leia. Uh, in issue number four, if you remember in this... Star Wars comic in issue number four, there was a cloaked uh, character that was on Tatooine um, looking, I believe, for, I think, Luke Skywalker, or was it Han Solo? Somebody was looking for Han Solo, I think. It was a hooded cloak character, and there was a scene reminiscent of Han Solo in the cantina bar. Remember when Han Solo shot Greedo under the table? Well, they did a play on that with this hooded character. That character from issue number four gets revealed in here. That's all I'm going to tell you. And it is huge. I cannot stress how big this is. Like, it is so huge that, like, my jaw dropped when, when I read this and saw this. And I was like, oh, shit. And all I'm going to say is another thing, again, it is going to change how you look at Princess Leia and, uh, Princess Leia and Han Solo's relationship from all the movies. It's going to really make you wonder some things. And I want to give a credit out to Jason Aaron, who's the writer in here, for taking a huge risk. And I can't wait to see how this plays out, out in the Star Wars universe. So, pretty, pretty cool. All right, so now the next Marvel Star Wars comic, Darth Vader, which is my second favorite one. You know, Darth Vader, he's got issues, you know, he... Uh, Kind of lost the Death Star under his command. There was a big uh, ammunition output on this moon base that uh, he fucked up too. He was like the leader of that mission too. And the Rebel Alliance stuck it to him again. Luke Skywalker, 
Chewy, Leia, Han, they, they gave it to him up to you-know-what again. Uh, he's just been in trouble. So he ends up running into the Emperor on this secret, like, outland planet. And the Emperor has been working on, let's see, uh, let me just read this to you. Uh, blah, blah, blah. With a newly acquired droid army, Darth Vader stormed a secluded stronghold in the Outer Rim, where a technology specialist named Silo has been secretly working for Palpatine, creating lightsaber-wielding cyborgs. Now in the presence of the Emperor himself, Lord Vader, Lord Vader must fight for both his honor and his life against Silo's team of technically enhanced warriors. So, yeah, the Emperor is putting him to the test, Darth Vader, against these cyborgish warriors. So, a little teaser action. Darth Vader kind of putting the, putting the old lightsaber into the shoulder there. Looks like putting it through the chest there. Emperor watching it. Probably secretly getting a hard on or something. You know, he's into it, man. Look at him, man. He is into it. He is into it. He's sweating and shit. I mean, he is getting into it. We all have our kicks, right? We all get into things. And I guess that's what he's into. So, again, really, really interesting to see how it goes. I can't wait. There are some flashback scenes in here, too, of Lord Vader when he was Anakin Skywalker. And it even has the likeness of whoever, oh, my God, who is that Canadian actor who played Anakin Skywalker? I can't think of his name. But uh, that's one of the things I really wanted to touch upon was that the writer for this book, uh, Kirian Gillen, has done a really good job of meshing together, you know, both the prequel movies and, you know, the New Hope movie together with this. You know, it's not like they've forgotten about the abysmal Star Wars episodes 1 through 3. They've really been incorporating it into the book. So that's really cool. Okay. Onward with uh, Princess Leia. Number four, this is my least favorite of the book. I'm not really a big fan of the art. The writing is not that great, I think. It's basically like Sinestro. It's it's like a Sinestro story. Um, Princess Leia is trying to find her fellow Aldurians. You know, her planet Alderaan got blown up by the Death Star. Okay, that's what happened in Star Wars. There's Alder Alderaans, Alderanians scattered throughout the universe. She's got to try to find him. She also has Darth Vader on her tail uh, because Darth Vader wants to exact revenge on everyone who's had anything to do with blowing up the Death Star. Um, I, I guess the artwork is just very, very, like, inconsistent, and it's just... It doesn't really look that good. I don't like the coloring. Uh, I don't know. There's just not too much that I like about this. Princess Leia is a real... She, she's kind of, like, jerky, you know? I mean, I love strong female characters and everything, but she's just so freaking harsh, you know, uh, that it's just kind of hard for me to get really into it. Um, there are some, you know, pretty cool underlying storylines. Uh, there's an unknown traitor in their midst uh, that she's not aware about, so, so it's kind of cool to see how that maybe is going to turn out. But overall, I'm kind of glad that this series is coming to a conclusion. This is issue number four of five. And then once this wraps up, I guess they're going to be coming out with a Lando Calrissian miniseries, which I probably definitely will be buying too because that sounds really neat. And I'm a big motherfucking fan of Billy D. Williams, baby. He was one of my favorite characters in The Empire Strikes Back, Colt 45, Malt Liquor. All right, number one, Groot. I'll tell you something. I don't know anything about Groot. I did an unboxing. I know that Groot is part of Guardians of the Galaxy. I know he's like a big tree. I know he doesn't talk and doesn't say much. I got the pop art figure of Groot. I did an unboxing here on my channel many months ago where I played a character known as Dank Nugs when I did the unboxing. 
You should check it out. Maybe I'll put a link to it. Uh, it kind of freaked people out the way I did the unboxing. I assumed like a whole character. I kind of presented myself as being, you know, delusional and psychotic. And uh, a lot of people that weren't familiar with my channel found it to be very believable. So if you want to check me out in a little bit of acting, you can kind of, uh, you know, I'm giving you the lowdown here. That's not, you know, really how I act, but... There's people out there on the Internet that think that I do. So that was kind of fun. I don't know. I may have to resurrect the character Dank Nugs again. But anyway, the artwork looks pretty cool. The artwork looks pretty cool. It's interesting. Um, I'm going to totally rip this off from the Coast City Comics uh, vlog. Coast City Comics up in Portland, Maine. It's a great comic book shop that I went to when I was on vacation in Maine last year. Last summer, which is actually right around the time when I started collecting comics again, uh, they made a point that Groot kind of looks like, with that jaw and the goofy expressions, Frankenberry from the cereal. You know Frankenberry, right? And I was like, holy shit, he does look like Frankenberry. He, he looks ridiculously like fucking Frankenberry. I mean, look at these pictures. Right? Is that not like a Frankenberry grill? Even there? Like just the squareness? Very, very expressive. I guess from what I understand, Rocket Raccoon is in this and does the majority of the dialogue. Uh, I guess because Rocket Raccoon has to uh, be his translator. And I, I don't know. It's like I'm looking through this. And he just keeps saying over and over again, I am Groot. I am Groot. Like, there's so many freaking panels where he's just saying, I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. Uh, so I'm really like, what's up with this? But I wanted to give it a shot. I know that so many people love Guardians of the Galaxy. I've never even, I haven't even seen the movie yet. I know, I'm kind of holding out for it to hopefully come on Netflix. Uh, but I'm willing to give this a shot. It's a number one. I guess Rocket Raccoon is ending, from what I understand. So a lot of people are complaining already that this pretty much maybe is just kind of a continuation of Rocket Raccoon because when you're looking through this issue, it seems that Rocket Raccoon has like 90% of the dialogue or something. So... I don't know. Who knows how it's going to go? I mean, give it a shot, right? I mean, it's kind of like one of the only lighthearted books I read in my poll is Harley Quinn. So I'm thinking, you know, let's maybe diversify the portfolio a little bit. and Maybe I should have another humorous uh, title in the, in, in the polls, you know? You know, as you guys know, people that watch my hauls know that uh, I'm a very, like, horror-heavy uh guy although this week it isn't but this week has been like a major major week for dc and marvel okay another marvel book we got the amazing spider-man spiral part three and i have some issues with this cover people basically this is uh you know kingpins away the cats will play there's a fight for uh who is taking over the underworld of uh new york city or wherever this city is Who's going to be the new crime boss? You have Black Cat in here making a wonderful appearance in this big spread. She kind of throws her hat in the ring amongst all these crime warlords. You have Wraith in here who uh, is kind of butting heads with Spider-Man. They kind of have two different styles of trying to get things done, of trying to procure information. So there's a lot of tension between uh, Spider-Man and Wraith. So... It's interesting, but hey, this cover is like a total ripoff of the Harley Quinn. Check this out, all right? Spider-Man, Black Cat, embracing Spider-Man, right? Batman and Harley Quinn in the Valentine's Day special, which I haven't read yet. That's part of the backlog. But come on, man. Totally. Spider-Man all tied up, dangling down. I think there I'm not sure if this was the variant cover or the regular one, but there was another cover 
where it was more like a pull-away shot, and I think it was reversed. I think it was Harley Quinn tied up with Batman kissing him. But come on, man. Talk about biting, right? That's unreal. It's such a bite. I don't know if that's like paying homage to it or or what or making fun of it. But when I saw that cover, I was like, what the fuck? I'm like, I've seen this before. Like, I've totally seen it. And I just, uh, I don't know. I just, I just had to show you guys that. And I don't know. I don't know what you think. I mean, pretty funny, though. Pretty funny. All right, another spider. Spider Woman. This is my favorite, one of my favorite underrated titles. Spider Woman. She has downsized. She has a new costume. She rides a motorcycle. She's no longer part of, like, the Avengers or S.H.I.E.L.D. She's just decided to focus on small-time crime and criminals in her neighborhood of New York City. And what that's done is that it's allowed the writers to focus more on characterization and not just big action stories. And I got to tell you, I love it. I love it. And not only that, she battles another woman in this issue... That's in like a construction mech suit, a.k.a. Ripley in Aliens. That's Sigourney Weaver? I mean, honestly, basically the whole storyline behind this is that there's these like D-list, E-list, Z-list villains whose family members have been getting kidnapped. Spider-Woman is hot on the trail to investigate why that's going on and what's up. What's the deeper issue here? So... Great, great book. I love the artwork. Uh, Dennis Hopeless is the writer. Javier Rodriguez is the penciler. And Alvarado Lopez is the inker. Mushente, M- Musta Vicente is the colorist. I don't know. I think that might be a new colorist for this issue. But pretty, pretty cool, man. I'm really digging Spider-Woman. There's a view of her wings. I mean, she's just great, man. She's humorous. She's funny. She's a little bit self-deprecating. Uh, witty as well. And she's just an awesome character. I really, really like her. And she's getting up there with um, Lucifer from Hexed as uh, one of my favorite uh, female characters, female superheroes. So I'm really, really stoked about that. All right, now I got one image comic this uh, week, and that is the Autumn Lands, formerly known as just Tooth and Claw. Now it's Autumn Lands, Tooth and Claw. And this is the final issue of the first uh, arc. So this is issue number six. Telling you if you love anthropomorphic animals, if you love factions, if you love magic. If you love, like, necromancy, all that good stuff, you're going to love this book, this fantasy adventure. There's seven scars of the Buffalo tribe. He has to do out with the Grand Champion. I'm kind of sick and tired of telling you guys what this book is about. I'm trying to work on that because repeat viewers of this show know that, uh, you know, I kind of give these little summaries of the books every week, but... I can't just keep giving, you know, the backstory every week, you know. It's getting a little bit repetitive for the people that always watch. But if you like fantasy, if you like different classes of characters, animals, if you like Spuds McKenzie from the Budweiser days, I'm telling you, you're going to love this. And this culminates. I I said that wrong. But it's been a very big build-up to this buffalo tribe uh, wanting to fight the other animals. And it is going to be a huge, epic battle. I'm excited. I mean, I haven't even looked through this yet. But I can already see that there's going to be major, major freaking fireworks. Uh, This is by uh, Kurt Busick's The Writer. Excellent. And Benjamin Dewey is the artist. I really, really enjoy this. And I'm not sure if Image is going to be taking a break in between the first arch like they do with some comics, like Rasputin, or if they're just going to keep plugging away. I'm not really sure about that, but definitely check out the Autumn Lands if you really need your anthropomorphic fix. 
because we all need anthropomorphic animals in our lives. Okay, the Mignolaverse pick of the week here is Baltimore, the cult of the Red King. The Red King. These guys are broken up into two teams. You have Lord Baltimore. Let me see here. I forget exactly where Lord Baltimore is going with this. I promise I'm going to take notes. I promise I'm going to take notes. Anyway, the point is the team is broken up in two. One of the teams uh, has to go down into this set of catacombs. And there's a group of witches down there. So I can't wait to see what happens. Um, and then the other group is entering into a city where they may find more clues and whereabouts of where this Red King is. Now, Lord Baltimore is usually a loner. He usually goes out on these missions on his own. Uh, but he's with a team, like I said, in this book. And it's really interesting to see how Lord Baltimore is relax, uh, reacting to working with a team. He still seems to be isolated, and he has a lot of issues with connecting with people. As we know, Lord Baltimore's uh, family got killed by a group of vampires, and he decided to um, exact revenge. Uh, on There's one vampire in particular. Oh, I can't remember his name. Why can't I remember his name? Oh my god, I can't remember his name. But anyway, one of these vampires actually is one of the high priestess for the Red King. So that's pretty interesting connection as well. I mean, you got the team of Christopher Golden. Dave Stewart is doing the coloring. And Peter Bertang, uh, he's not an artist that I'm familiar with. Uh, but he definitely makes this book look like, uh, you know, a Mignola book. Um, classic looking creatures as to be expected in a Mignola book um, and I look forward to you know getting through this maybe learning a little bit more behind the psychology and the characterization of Lord Baltimore it seems like more and more comics that I'm reading are kind of like touching upon the subjects of PTSD and what battle does to someone and the effects that it has on someone. And I think it's great. I think, you know, it's great to kind of add these elements and these layers to these characters who uh, are always presented to us as so invulnerable, right? Um, it kind of, you know, makes them more human in a way and for the better. So really looking forward to reading that. And then finally, finally, people... At the end of this 12-issue run, I have from Boom Comics, Plunder, number four of four, the Monster Mash title. Uh, the last issue of this was crazy. Uh, you know, there were, like, a lot of revelations. Um, it it, it kind of makes you wonder if these people are just, like, hallucinating on LSD. I mean, like, the last issue was just such a trip. There were great monster sequences. Great monster deaths. It was just a trippy, trippy issue. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, what happens. Is this young man who served as an interpreter on this boat, is he going to let this monster take everyone down? I mean, it looks like it. Uh, or is he going to slay that beast? And Swifty Lang... And Scuds McKinley, who's the artist, uh, they did it. You know, it was a good tale. Uh, so far, you know, I'm really enjoying it. Tons and tons of cool, creepy crawlies in here. Uh, I did. I won't say that I ever really got scared, but it was more just kind of like seat of your pants adventure kind of gory stuff. I mean, I never got scared. I mean, in some instances, I got a little taken aback. Um but, I mean, look at this shit. I mean, this is like burning faces with acid and all kinds of crazy stuff in here. Creepy crawly. So, I don't know. It was like the last issue they alluded to, you know, that there's like drugs and stuff. That there may be some kind of weird, crazy hallucinations going on here. I and mean, look at that with the ripple effect. So, I'm hoping that, you know, we're going to get some answers. Who knows? You know, maybe this is just some kind of like chemical 
biological warfare agent or something. I don't know. Who knows? All right, I'm done talking out my ass, peeps. That's been issue number 38. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to get some feedback from you guys and then be on the lookout. Uh, I'm going to be talking about these guys in another video, the Amiibos and the Amiibo Crisis. That's a silver, Mario. These things are harder to get than illegal drugs. They're harder to get. They, they're, they're just crazy. All right, people. Take it easy. Peace. Let me know what books you got. Give me some feedback, all right? Uh, I noticed that the views have been dropping a little bit, but I'd love to hear your guys' comments. If you have any ideas about what you would like to see me do on here, just let me know, you know? And, and if you have any kind of constructive criticism, I can take it, you know? Let me know, you know? I'm, I'm an adult. I can hear it. Let me, uh, let me hear the feedback, all right, guys? So peace and enjoy your books this week. Adios.